Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching from Israel by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. This week, a mutiny in the palace leads to the king of Israel, who was the worst of the worst. Coming up on Kings and Kingdoms. So glad you've joined us today. I am David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I am Jeffrey Seif. And what do you think of my royal bling here? <laughs> you know, people came to power in antiquity. They were decked out, yes? They were. Fancy stuff. Yeah. But here's the thing. We're talking about Southern Kingdom today. And we're starting out with a king that was seven years old. I mean, that's probably taller than he was. He yeah. was just a little one. For him, this bling didn't mean a thing. You know, he was too young, but uh, he grew into something, and did he grow into the right thing? Right. I'm excited to hear about our Southern Kingdom kings today on That's the right. program. Right now, we take you to Jerusalem for Dr. Seif's teaching. Let's go there now. His name was Yehoash, from the Hebrew Eish, meaning fire. Uh, the name means fire of God. He started off as a little spark that almost was extinguished. He grew into a, a, a beautiful fire, but eventually he was extinguished and came to an inglorious end with all the power that he had surrounded by ramparts, castle, and wall, like right here in Jerusalem, it couldn't save him. Actually, his story began as a very young child when a woman in uh, the Bible was hell-bent on destroying the royal seed. In 2 Kings chapter 11, the story begins to unfold. This child, however, was stealthily smuggled away from the carnage. The rest of his family was decimated, but he survived. And eventually, under the tutelage of a priest, under a priest's guidance, who himself facilitated something of a coup to bring him to power, uh, this young boy comes of age, he comes into his own, and becomes something of a faithful, king in Jerusalem for a season. I don't want to overstate his faithfulness, however, because he came to a tragic end. I'd like you to look in your Bible, please. I'm in 2 Kings chapter 11, and I'll read it in mine. Vayik wrote Yehoiada et Habrit, and uh, made a covenant, uh, Yehoiada, uh, Jehoiada, who was the priest who superintended uh, this king, Joash, he made a covenant. Bain Adonai uvein hamelach uvein ha'am. Between the Lord, between the king, and between the people. Lehiot la'am la'adonai. That they should be the Lord's people. Now this is good. We're seeing here there is someone who comes to power and his power is galvanized with a prophetic seal, with some divine intentionality of faithfulness to the covenant. So I like to see that. When people come to power in any culture, I like to see individuals who are tethered to Judeo-Christian literature 
that they're not minded just to parrot these things in order to galvanize votes from evangelicals, but people who actually appreciate and live by them. Well, so far, so good that this covenant was made between the Lord, the King, and the people, that they should be the Lord's people. Uvein ha-melech, uvein ha-am. It was made between the King and the people as well. And then that's verse 17 and verse 18. I don't want to snow job with you a lot of Hebrew, but you know, we're all about our Hebrew roots, you know, and there's, there it is. That all the people of the land then went to the house of Baal. That is in the wake of making an executive decision and in a commitment to the Lord, we're told, kol am beta Baal. All the people of the land then went to the house of the pagans. And broke down the altars. What I want you to see here is, is a paradigm shift. What happens is through sloth, indolence, indifference, faithlessness, sin grows up in a culture. But what happens here, someone comes into his own and is guided by someone with biblical values and vision, and there is a covenant commitment uh, that brings the people, the Lord, and the, the, the leadership together in a commitment to the Lord, subsequent to which they start undoing the things around them that had grown up that were problematic. Listen, I can live with this. I like that. Would that I would see it more and more in our culture. That is to say, people come to power with biblical vision and there's some kind of commitment to inculcate that vision into the broader culture. To my way of thinking in my own culture, there are many things that are bombastic. The slaughter of the innocents being one of them that's been perennial. It's been going door to door from generation to generation. It seems that, that we're killing the unborn. It seems we're doing a lot of wrong things that, uh, that are offensive to biblical vision, to my way of thinking. Uh, things grow up in culture for one reason or another that are antithetical to the virtues that were constitutive in the founding of the culture. Well, it not only happens today, it happened yesterday, thus the text. And so we're at a place in the book where there's a commitment that's made and then there is this momentum to eradicate that which was problematic. I like to see that. But speaking of problematic, something happened in the wake of that that was really troublesome. And that is, here there's a king, the fire of God, he burns out. He's riding a wave of popularity, of enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm in Greek, entheos, means in God. You know, he's definitely working within that world, but he gets too full of himself. And I've seen this happen on more than one occasion. I remember uh, when I began the journey as a college teacher, uh, my mentor, uh, when I began the journey at the Muda Bible Institute in Chicago, was a Jewish believer. Uh, Louis Goldberg, Dr. Goldberg, uh, was a Jewish studies professor, and you know I studied under him. And uh, I moved to Dallas. I wind up becoming a professor myself of Jewish studies. And Dr. Goldberg said, Jeff, it's not how you start a race that matters. It's how you finish it. And 30 years into the game, and that's how long I've been teaching, among other things, I get his point. We want to have a good finish. This one didn't. He got intoxicated by himself, full of himself. The prophet who guided him, he winds up slaying his son because his son criticized him. This king wants to be the object of worship instead of worshiping God. He's going to come to an inglorious end. In fact, he's going to be murdered. Tragic. There's a story here about someone who started good enough but ended bad. There's lessons in the Bible, and when I think of kings and kingdoms, and that is the object of our attention, we're throwing light at that. Um, I want to have the right kind of kings that live by the right kind of values, thinking it bodes better for the kingdoms wherein they exercise influence, not just yesterday, but today. When you have opportunity to vote for someone, whether it's a local election or a national one, look for those who live their lives in accordance with biblical faith, value, and vision. According to the Greeks, 
It was the beauty of one princess, Helen of Troy, that launched a thousand ships. And according to the Hebrew Bible, it was the perfidy, that is the faithlessness of one king that launched one prophet, arguably the most famous prophet in the Hebrew Bible. And what interests me is that the author of Kings doesn't want to talk about it. It's a scandal. It's an outrage. It's an upset. It's the unexpected for Uzziah, arguably was one of the greats. The author of Chronicles goes into great details in chapter 26, but in 2 Kings 15, where we're going to alight, five scant verses are dedicated to a telling of this man's life, his ministry, and his misery. Let me begin at Chronicles. Therein we learn about a man named Uzziah, also referred to as Azariah. He starts off as a teenager, 16 years of age, and he starts off great. The author of 2 Kings, as you'll see, says as much. The greatness is, uh, uh, is enfleshed in the Chronicles account, wherein the author there says how he built up uh, Judea's army, it was magnificent. Uh, the author goes out of his way to say they're all, uh, according to their various battalions, they're uh, adorned in various colors. They have the necessary accoutrements. It speaks of wealth and power and strength. And uh, speaking of strength, therein we're told that it was this Uzziah who built up Jerusalem. The ramparts, the walls were built with fortifications akin to where we are right now in a wall around Jerusalem. He built up battle stations, that is defensive fortifications. Beyond that, he expanded the realm. He had so much going for him, according to the author of Chronicles. But then something tragic happened. Scant attention is given to it in uh, 2 Kings chapter 15. Uh, therein we're told, looking in verse 3, relative to this Uzziah, whose name means God is my strength, who's also called Azariah, which means God has helped. But we'll see how strength and help evaporate. We're told here in the text in verse 3, And he did that which was right, or that which was straight, not crooked, straight in the eyes of the Lord. It's a poetic expression, for he was a tzaddik, he was a righteous man, he was just, equitable, good, God-fearing. Of so many kings, it says they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not this one, at least not at first. He's noted for his stellar performance in verse 3, but then, interestingly, in verse 5, and tragically, with no details given here, again, for that we go to 2 Chronicles, but with no details here, we're told, And the Lord smote the king, indicative of a judgment. And we're told particularly, And that he was a leper until the day of his death noted therein is a providential affliction. A sudden death would have been kinder. Leprosy is death by inches. Inasmuch as crucifixion wasn't about killing a man, it's making a statement. Don't mess with Rome. Crucifixion kills you as painfully, and it goes on as long as it was known to man at the time. Leprosy before that is akin to that in that it's a slow moving death. Why is it that the author of 2 Kings notes that he did right in the eyes of the Lord. And in the aftermath of that, with really little no de to no details to speak of, we're told that he incurred God's judgment with, 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 with a judgment like this. The author in Chronicles tells the story how what he did is he got full of himself. This Uzziah was very powerful. And it can be with political leaders. They start off right, the head is in the right place, the heart is in the right place, but then they, they're full of hubris. 
uh, they get so full of themselves. They think they're God's gift to planet Earth. And instead of following God, they want to play God. And in fact, Uzziah's problem was akin to that in that political power wasn't enough. He wanted to claim uh, for himself tasks that belonged to the priests in going into the temple and doing his various sacrifices. He wanted to be more than what he was. And the net result is that God struck him uh, with a providential affliction. Would that people that had power, would that they learned their bounds. This becomes a problem. People get intoxicated by it. Uh, they overextend themselves. There's overreach and there's judgment. We see it happen in biblical literature. And if you look at the story of Kings, Therein the author just gives little bites, sometimes a paragraph, maybe a chapter, a few words about these various kings in Israel and Judah. Most of them don't even start off right. Those that do go south because they get full of themselves. Instead of following God, they want to play God. Listen to me. It's important for us to vote in leaders that don't just have the right ideas, but they have the right kind of character. We want to look for that character that's tested and true. Napoleon Bonaparte said, give a guy some, you know, elevate a guy, make him a corporal, give him some power, and you see what they're made out of. I like to see what people are made out of, the lives they live, how they are with their wives, how they are with their friends, how they deal with people, not just, you know, ideas, political ideas. We need to find the right kind of people. The author of Kings says as much, and would that we learned that lesson and got the right kind of people in the right kind of place so we can have the right kind of result. Our resource this week, the series Kings and Kingdoms. These eight programs examine the rulers of ancient Israel and Judah because within their stories, we find lessons of godly leadership and principles we can observe today, even in our political leaders. Get this series for yourself or to share with friends by contacting us and asking for the DVD series, Kings and Kingdoms. If you only watch us on television, you're missing additional content available only on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can always visit our website, which is home base for all of our ministry activities and information. There you can sign up for our free monthly newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit the online store. You can sign up for a tour of Israel and Petra or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. We're a television program, I think that's obvious, but we're also a ministry that has taken tours to Israel for over 35 years as part of who we are and what we do and our vision. You can be a part of that. Go to the Holy Land. I believe that God will beckon and He does beckon people to come visit His land. We'd love for you to join us. We also want to thank you for your financial support. We could not do any of this without you. Again, we just want to say thank you so much. Right now, let's go back to Sarah Lee. Remember, we hope you're enjoying her Hebrew lessons. King David was a praise and worshiper. It's about him today. Let's go there now. Shalom, chaverim. Welcome back to our series, Exploring Words of Worship in Hebrew. I'm so excited as a worship leader that we get to do this together because I know that if you take these meanings of these words in Hebrew into your own personal worship life, they will transform your relationship with God. You see, in English, we have two primary words, praise and worship. But in Hebrew, where those words are mentioned, there's so much more that comes into our expression of worship. Today's word is the word lezamel. Now in modern day Hebrew, that word can be translated as to sing. But in the Bible, it means to make music with musical instruments. Isn't that great news for us as musicians? King David had a heart after the Lord, and he would make and create all kinds of different instruments so that God could be worshiped in song and in music. 
So as we go forward in our worship services, in our worship life, sometimes just making music unto the Lord, just having no words sung, but having musicians offer a offering of thanksgiving unto the Lord on their instruments is a blessing to God's heart. The Bible really is a beautiful story, and I'd like to punctuate Bible teaching with beautiful music. And who better than our founder, Zola Levitt, a very accomplished musician in his own right, and I'm glad you got to experience him. Now, however, we go from inspiration to desperation. The world's gone bad. We're looking at biblical literature. Uh, the good news is so good because the bad news can be so very bad. People blew it. Leaders went south. Uh, Dr. Baruch Kavashnikov is going to talk to us about that as we continue on our journey into the kings of Israel and Judah. Baruch, there's an old saying, another one bites the dust. I hated to see this guy fall apart, but Uzziah fell hard, didn't he? He really did. He did it because he took on too much. He wanted to be king, he wanted to be priest, he wanted to do it all. He had a lot going for him at the start. He was very promising, but then he went south. He really did. The key moment is when he attempts to go into the temple and bring that sacrifice himself rather than letting the priest do it, as God had ordained. Yeah, you know, and it reminds me, there are some people, they come to power and they do it right, but they get too addicted to it, they want more of it, and it becomes their downfall. They're not team players, and Uzziah wasn't a team player here. He didn't allow that. In fact, God punished him greatly. He broke out with a type of leprosy, a scale disease, which is indicative that he had pride in his heart. Yeah. He wanted everything and he came to nothing and he came to it painfully slow. I mean, he starts off with divine promise, but then he winds up with divine punishment, not good. We have amazing archeological evidence of Uzziah needing to build a freestanding house because of his leprosy. And that's been discovered at a place called Ramat Rachel today. Fascinating because the text says that he dwelt alone. That's right. As I recall correctly. This is because he had this scaly disease, which we see linked again and again to pride. In Psalm 51, David says, purify me with, with uh, hyssop. Just like the person who has leprosy needs that purification process. And Uzziah needed that healing in his heart, which would have resulted probably in the healing of his skin, but it never happened. The last word's yours, but it reminds me that politicians that get so full of themselves, they become diseased in a certain way, and we see it literally with this one. We only have a few seconds left. What say you? Uzziah had outward signs of an inward reality that were troubled greatly, and we hope that each person would have purity of heart, and our leaders would as well. Thank you. We hope you're enjoying learning about kings and leadership as much as Kirsten and I are. I, I say enjoy, but there's a lot of tragedy with these guys. Yes, when uh, I look at the Bible, and the Bible is the great professor in the sky giving grades. Now, he's not inclined to go A, B, C, D, or F, but uh, the scores are notated in the literature. Uh, Joash 
You know, I kind of debated him a little bit. I'm going to give him a C. Wow. I was going to go D. That's as good as it gets so far. And the reason is because uh, the Bible says he did good all the days of his life. But the reason why I'm not grading him higher and I was tempted to grade him lower is adultery was everywhere around him, idolatry, and he wasn't minded to get rid of it. Okay. He let it all stand. So he develops a toleration that I find problematic. Now, I'm, I'm curious. This is of what you're going to give Uzziah. I'm very curious about well, this. Well, I love him, okay. but then I don't. I mean, he's one of those, he starts off with an A. He does so good. I mean, I'm really rooting for him, rooting for him, but at the end, he blows it. Uh, I've got to give him arrow. an F. Now, I'm going to give him an F because God gives him an F. What happens is he does so good. He's strong. He builds up the military. He builds up the right. borders. He fortifies the walls. There's prosperity. But then he gets too full of himself. He, he, he takes on more than he should. He, uh, he acts like a priest when he wasn't. And God judged him with an F by giving him leprosy, mm. which is a kind of living so death. So dramatic. that's God's score. Yeah, yeah. tragic. It is so tragic. We th we think that all the you know great scripts and the the drama comes from Hollywood. It's right here in the Bible. I mean, he's swinging his incense, right? The priest said, "Ah, ah, ah, you know, don't do that." And then God just starts with a little circle of leprosy, and then it spreads. I mean, it's dramatic, right there on the scene. Totally. Oh my goodness, yeah. it is. You know, Cecil B. DeMille said, "Give me any two pages, I can give you an epic motion picture." There, there are a lot of pages right here. There really it. are. Yeah. And one of the things we do is we try and bring them all to life. I say that because uh, we do dramatic vignettes. We take people to Bible lands. Now we don't have Cecil B. B. DeMille's budget. Uh, we're not a big movie house in Hollywood. We really are simple people on a Spartan budget. If you love what we do by looking at the news through the eyes of the Jews, if you love it, don't love in word and speech, but in deed and in truth. Please catch up with us and give us a dime so we can pay the airtime. We really need it, and God will bless you for helping us get it. Give us a quick takeaway for today, what we've learned. Let's uh, run the race and be faithful to the end. Amen. That's good. We have more coming up next week. Watch us next week. Come back. And speaking of the end, as we go now, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to our Jewish roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.